I just came from a really wonderful event here in DC at Buster Boys and Poets, which was kind of an open mic where just people, not necessarily the usual people, but some people who are not the usual crowd came in and uh, came out and kind of spoke from the heart about what's happening, how they see it, what their thoughts are. And it was really very, very moving. So it's something that uh, I strongly recommend, just kind of a, you know, a place to get together and just talk as opposed to receive information or argue or express opinions just to kind of speak from the heart. It was very, it was very helpful. It was very good. Um, well, like you said, I, I, I'm, you know, I was born and raised in, in, uh, in a very Zionist family in Jerusalem. My family is still there. Maybe I'll pop back and forth. I mean, I've had family in Kibbutz Beri, which is one of the Kibbutzim that was very heavily hit by the Palestinian fighters. Um, what I heard, I was talking to my sister this morning, it's completely wiped out. And my cousin and her husband, um, who are in their seventies now are were one of the last ones who somehow well, their home was not, uh, hurt and they were only, um, evacuated today. So they've been there seven, eight, nine, ten 10 for three days hiding in their home quietly trying to figure out how to you know play with a lock so nobody can unlock and come in and as fighting was going on outside and um another kibbutz where i have family kibbutz zikib also right in, just just on the border with gaza just north of gaza there's been fighting there and lots of other places in that area so you know my family back there are everybody's terrified i have to say not only my family israelis are terrified they've never seen anything like this before and you know it, it puts me and them once again in a in a difficult situation because my stance even though i come from this very zionist family with a father who was a general and so on and your grandfather you know, was a signatory to israeli independence right my grandfather signed the general the uh israeli um declaration of independence so he was an important zionist uh leader and you know my entire family come you know are part of that you know zionist uh leadership that's established and then ran the state for for the first few decades um but i i i was saying today in this open mic thing you know i i don't stand in solidarity with palestinians i don't support the palestinian cause i see myself as part of the struggle as part of the cause i'm not separate from it and expressing solidarity and uh when my family's over there going through this people are afraid to leave the house they don't know what's going on the army's collapsed the police has collapsed the, the, everything they relied on or they used to rely on has collapsed. In other words, there's nobody protecting people. And that's a very scary place to be. And the children are afraid and, you know, and, um, and here I am, you know, making these very bold statements in support of the Palestinians and the Palestinian resistance. So it put us all in a, in a, in a strange, uh, or somewhat strained, um, kind of situation. I did speak to my, like I said, I spoke to my sister this morning at length and kind of to learn where they're standing and what's going on because the news we get, here and even the news they get there is um is is incomplete because nobody has the full picture israelis are do not know what's going on the israeli government doesn't say anything the military has as far as anybody can see fallen apart it's mostly groups of guys who are reservists who just put on their uniform grab a gun and go with their buddies to fight somewhere you know and so they're in a very difficult position and uh, like i said here i am you know standing here either a kofia or a palestinian flag speaking in support of the palestinian or as part of the palestinian struggle um and you know so this is one part of what my family is going through and i was thinking today you know as you know i have two young children they're half of their grand they have grandparents and uncles and aunts who are palestinians and they have grants grandparents and aunts and uncles who are israeli and they never met and it's not because they're in gaza or the west bank they live an hour drive within you know on on, on the main highway but they never met and it's likely that they never will at least not in the near future so this is kind of a unique situation that i'm a unique position that i'm in and eventually they're going to be in and um we had another you know unique experience a tragedy when 1997 um my sister's little girl was killed in a suicide bombing and so that also put our family in this uh Straight, a very different space because we were a family that came from 
kind of very liberal Zionist, supporting the two-state solution. My father, after he retired, you know, pushed very hard for negotiations with, with the Palestinians for the two-state solution, for a Palestinian state, for Palestinian rights within that framework. He even met with Yasser Arafat. And so, and then suddenly, you know, his granddaughter was killed by Palestinians. I mean, boom. I mean, it just kind of shows you this, this uh, very bizarre reality that exists there. And how are you just kind of thrown into this reality, regardless of, you know, you just happen to have been born to this, to this reality. Um, so the strangeness or the uniqueness, I should say, of, of my situation, my position in this, in this story, um, it comes to light every so often. There's something that brings it up to the surface and I have to stop for a minute and realize, wow, you know, I haven't spoken to my family since the attack on October the 7th until this morning because it's a little bit strange, you know? Um, so anyway, that's kind of the, that's the background of, of where I, you know, where, where I come from and where I am today. I just want to add that, you know, something that was so amazing about your story and I really recommend that everyone read uh, The General Sun was how it was in some ways the killing of your niece that radicalized you. I mean, you, you, you don't know how to respond when something, nobody knows how to respond when something like this happens. But the one thing that it does is it shakes you up to a point where something changes, you know, it's a kind of uh, shock that just changes everything. And so, uh, you know, I really have to thank my sister who stood up and said, first of all, don't talk to me about revenge and retaliation and killing more people. And number two, for pointing the finger at the Israeli government and saying, well, you treat people like this, this is the result. So you're, it's, it's Israel's, Israel is to blame. And I think it's, it's relevant today, too. This is exactly what is happening today, too. I mean, you keep people treated like this, you're going to get, this is, the, this is what you're going to get. And then that started my brain kind of gave me, I think, a direction to go in. And then I uh, began, you know, to engage and, and meet Palestinians and, and, and so on. And, you know, this I, we, we, we very often, you know, this, the violence in Palestine has been completely normalized. Okay, so three people blew themselves up. There was a suicide bombing. There were five people injured, blah, blah, blah. Wait, wait a minute, what? Three young people? We never stopped for a moment and paused to take it in and let it sink in. Three young men blew themselves up? and killed a whole bunch of other young innocent people with them what are, what is going on here this how do, how can we go on beyond that and talk about anything else we need to stop right there and say wait a minute say that again who are these people where do they come from what is the what is the larger story here you know we're not talking about you know just you know something that's out of the blue we're talking about there's context here there's a political context here that we can't ignore and then we have to de dig deep into it. and that's what i did i chose to dig into it and you know i came out you know radicalized and 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 i suppose and 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 with the opinions and the decisions that i made about my life and my and my and my work what is this story the context that so much of the media is leaving out because you see these people who it's very i find this very hard to to deal with right now because people really think that they're just when they express sympathy um towards the israelis who have been killed they don't think that they need to mention the palestinians who have been killed or they don't think that they need to mention what um netanyahu is responding with or they don't feel that they need to mention how Israel created the situation in the in the first place. So can you fill that in? So Netanyahu on October 7th already he said we are at war with you know we are at war. Well excuse me Israel declared war on the Palestinians 75 years ago. That war has been going on against Palestinians. Palestinians have been the victims of a vicious savage I would say brutality for 75 years, uh, the fact that the 2 million people are locked up in the concentration camp, which some people now say has been turned into an extermination camp in the Gaza Strip, is only a, is only a part of this horrific story, this savagery that Palestinians have been subjected to. 
Palestinians have never had an army. They still don't have an army. What we saw is a, is a small, you know, guerrilla group. It's not an army um, operating. And so Israel has been murdering civilians, just possessing people, torturing them, beating them, taking away their land, stealing from them, uh, stealing from their stealing their homes and their land and their resources, and their uh, and, the, and their trees and their money and on and on and on. For 75 years, Israel declared this war 75 years ago. Netanyahu thinks the war started now. This has nothing to do with Hamas. These are Palestinian fighters from the Gaza Strip in an act of resistance. Now, I, I, I don't think I'm saying anything that anybody would disagree with when I say that it's, it breaks your heart when, every, when a person gets killed. Everybody has a mother and a father. It's horrifying. It's horrifying. Of course it's horrifying when, when somebody gets killed. But what they do is they take it out of context. You cannot take this out of context. What we saw Palestinian fighters doing, and again, we don't know the full picture because there is no, there are, there's no reliable news source yet that I've seen anyway uh, that gives the entire picture. How many were taken? How many were killed? How many were injured? In what, under what circumstances? And so on. It does look like the decapitated babies is unfounded, by the way. Oh, it's claim. unfounded. Yeah, it's yeah. unfounded. And babies in, in chicken coops and cages yeah. are unfounded. But, I mean, it, the thing, and let's say, you know, what do you think happens when a one-ton bomb is dropped on a building? You think babies aren't decapitated? You think people aren't suffocated in the gases that come out and the smoke? The white phosphorus. And the white phosphorus? Yeah. And the buildings that fall on people, that people get trapped, and parts of their body gets... I mean, it goes on and on and on, the horror. You know what I mean? You want to get to the details of the horror? Fine, let's get into the details of the horror. Let me describe to you what happens when you drop a one-ton bomb on a, on a, on a, in a neighborhood, in a residential neighborhood. How many children get, you know... So that's not the issue. We need to see this in a political context. Now... Military, you know, military operations, acts of, you know, actions have to lead to a political outcome. That's the point of what, they, that's that's their objective. You know, people are always, you know, get stuck on the military side of it, on the, on, on the armed side of it. But the more important issue here is the political accomplishments, the political objective that is reached through the military goal. Now, Palestinians have been waiting for a peaceful resolution for decades, and their hands have been pushed, slapped away, and they've been humiliated over and over again. Every time they reach out, every time they try to, they agree to some kind of a solution, they get slapped in the face and humiliated. What? Just a couple of years ago, we saw the March of Return, where 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 people marched to the wall, to the gates of Gaza. And what did, what did they get? They got thousands of young Palestinians whose legs had to be amputated. There are over 2,000 young Palestinians whose legs have been amputated because of sniper fire that was directed against unarmed civilians who came to protest and say, you know, we want peace, we want freedom, we want to return to our homes and our land peacefully. So when something like this happens now, so they say, okay, fine, all this peaceful, uh, nonviolent stuff is great, but it's not working. Number one, and look at the and look at the results. Look at as innocent how many innocent civilians were killed, and this is only one example. The march of return is one example. There's right. so many others. So now where medics this. medics were targeted, yes, uh, members of the press were targeted yes. by snipers who are very good at their jobs. This yeah. wasn't an accident. Yeah, no, none of this was an accident, and there were no military. There was no military there. Everybody was a civilian. I mean, there is no like I said, there's no such thing as a Palestinian military. There never has been. They're all civilians. Some are policemen, maybe. And now you've got this military operation that, you know, I was listening to this one retired Israeli general. He couldn't stop praising the military, the, the you know, what, a, what an incredible military operation the, the Palestinians put together and executed. He was on and on and on and on talking about how, what, and it was. And look what they've accomplished. They have completely disrupted the state of Israel. They have completely disrupted. From a military point of view, this operation was a massive success. Are people suffering? Yes. Are people dead? Yes. Are innocent people uh, hurt and injured and killed? Yes. But it's not the only thing that exists. There's a whole other story to it. There's 2 million people who are being murdered on a regular basis by the thousands 
on a regular basis. They don't have access to water or electricity or, or you know, a child with a, people with curable diseases dying because Israel won't give them access to hospitals that are, you know, a 20-minute drive from Gaza. So that's the whole story. So now look what they've done. A handful of well-trained fighters. Look what they did. They disrupted the entire country. Tel Aviv airport is chaos, complete chaos. Flights don't want to, you know, uh, the foreign airlines don't want to land because the, the rockets are, fi are falling too close. Most of the Israeli airline pilots are also fighter pilots, so they've been, they've been called in. The airport is chaos. So militarily, this is, a, this is a huge accomplishment. This is a huge victory. And they're still fighting. All these days later, they're still fighting. They still, this massive Israeli army has not been able to stop them. Now, on top of all that, we know that negotiations are, are forthcoming because these things always end with negotiations. Right. Even though they're saying, right? They're saying uh, they're they not going say. to negotiate. They always say that. Right. But eventually they have to negotiate. So now the big question is, how, do, how, how is this military operation, which was very successful, going to be translated into real political gain for Palestinians? That's going to be the real test.